All right, this is, we're on the, um, yeah, whether uh, holiness, Catholicity, and apostolicity pertain to Phocianism. So we said neither holiness, Catholicity, nor apostolicity pertains to Phocianism. I think that's where we left off. Right? Yes, twenty-six three, right? So where are we are. Uh, so it is apparent that Phocianism is not ordered to the divine good either in its doctrine or in the sacraments or in its members. Therefore, it lacks the mark of holiness, proof of the antecedent. By reason of doctrine, if one rejects the infallible and living magisterium, the holiness of doctrine is profaned by the errors of private individuals or by a state of stagnation. But the reality is that there is no designated and infallible and living magisterium in the church of the Phocians. See, so it is, it, it is a, a, a religion. It has a hierarchy, but it does not have a magisterial hierarchy where you are obliged to give your assent to what is taught. And it has, doesn't claim infallibility. So something could be taught. It's something like the, the Anglican Church with its articles or, you know, this is what we think you should believe. But there is, there is no idea that this is, uh, they teach with the authority of God. That is key to the Catholic Church. Ruling the faithful in matters of religion with the authority of God. That's key. That's the whole thing. Otherwise, it's just like any other church. It's like the first church, first Baptist church of Squeedunk, Iowa. It would, it would not differ from it. It would just be bigger, have nicer churches, that's all. If it does not have that element of assistance of the Holy Ghost, it's zero. And that's what distinguishes it. And it proves it by its consistency in history. Despite all of the vicissitudes of the individuals in the church, that consistency of doctrine and of practice and discipline in the history of the church is proof of it because you could, you could never have that without the assistance of God. And the deviation and variation of all of the Protestant churches and the, the Phocian churches is proof of that. So, therefore, the sanctity of the doctrine is corrupted. What attests to the same thing is the fact that dogmas in Phocianism have taken on a cadaverous form. So that's one of the criticisms that Catholic theologians say about the schismatic Eastern religion and churches. They, uh, that there is no... I would just say uh, it, it, it stopped in the 8th century or the 9th century that, that the, any kind of development, true development of dogma or understanding of uh, the, the theology, etc., it, it's all just preservation of these things up to the year, whatever, 850, whatever they, they take. It, it's cadaverous. Uh, I will pass over here what we have said before about the errors of the old believers and the quietists. The old believers were the Russians who did not want the reforms of Peter the Great. B, by reason of the sacraments, the hierarchy also pertains to the sacraments, but the hierarchical order has been truly profaned by the Phocians. For all Phocianism at first obeyed the patriarch of Constantinople, then most of it gave its obedience to the Holy Synod of Peter the Great. And don't forget that the Russian Orthodox are by far the biggest of the Orthodox churches, <clears throat> which has no title of divine right, but has been manufactured purely out of the profane motive of worship of the prince or Caesaropapism. Therefore, Phocianism has profaned the very notion of hierarchy.
See, by reason of its members, Phocianism has perverse founders. They have not produced holy people worthy of the name, and they have not performed miracles, which are signs of sanctity. Therefore, Phocianism lacks sanctity. <clears throat> the principal authors are Phocius, Michael Cerularius, <coughs> <coughs> Gregory of Cyprus, Mark of Ephesus, Peter the Great, Tsar. Phocius was condemned by the Eighth Ecumenical Council for nefarious crimes. He was ambitious, at times a contemner of power, and at times a flatterer of it. So sometimes he would flatter the authority, sometimes he would have contempt for it. It is certain from unassailable historical proofs that he was a falsifier and full of frauds. <clears throat> Cerularius had the morals of Phocius, but not his intelligence. George of Cyprus denied the faith of Rome, which he had vehemently defended because of an ambitious seeking of the patriarchate, and ejected John Bacus, the legitimate patriarch from the See of Constantinople. Mark of Ephesus, by means of lies and altered texts, impeded in a restless fashion the ecclesiastical peace and union, both at the Council of Florence and again when he returned home. Peter the Great had the name of Great, owing certainly not to his sanctity. He was not known for that. He was the one that murdered his son. I don't know if you know that. Well, his son was revolting against him, though. It was something like uh, Absalom. But uh, he was... Quite ruthless, Peter the Great. There are not found true saints worthy of the name who have died outside of the Roman communion. The saints, however, whom the schismatics list in their menologies and hagiotics, either did not leave uh, the Roman communion or lacked true sanctity. This is evident, one, from the defect of arguments by which the Greek Russians have confirmed the holiness of even one schismatic man, two, by divine ordination. For the excellent charism of sanctity was promised to the group of unity, but the schismatics died outside the Roman communion, whose unity we have proven. Furthermore, the religious institutes, pious societies, etc., either have no vitality in Phocianism or proceed more from the civil prudence than from religion. Now, these are all things that you would have to prove at greater length. I mean, he's making assertions here that need proof. There is uh, Cardinal Hergenrotter, I believe, yes, wrote a, a three-volume, no, he wrote a big book, I can't remember, I think maybe it's one volume, in German, entitled Fotius. <laughs> it's in the library, and it's in uh, Frakturschrift, which is the old... German. Uh, so if you learn your German, you can find out all about Phocius. I'm sure that, as you know from the book, Cardinal Hergenrotha will, will give you, a, you know, quite a picture of Phocius. <laughs> but these are, this doesn't come up too much. Occasionally you bump into these people, particularly in Florida, because there's a lot of Greek Orthodox in Florida, Russian Orthodox though. So, you know, but it uh, you would want to, if ever, you would want to convert an Orthodox, you would have to research these things and explain them. This is just giving you the basics. You know, it's hard to argue, you know, if someone was holy or not. You know, that's a little bit subjective. You know, if somebody, because uh, they have monasteries and all, and, you know, there's a, a certain aspect of it in uh, um, in the Orthodox religion. You know, it's just, uh, as I said, you would have to do a lot of research for people that, whom they consider saints. And all. Mm -hmm. Three, there are no true miracles found in favor of the schism for what is reported sometimes in favor of the separated church and against the union of the Ruthenians with the See of Peter are not events which require a supernatural cause. Gobulev, in his book which he wrote about Peter M Mihila, the Metropolitan of Kiev, alleges strongly that divine miracles took place in favor of the schism, 
But Martyov, an expert in Russian affairs, affirms that these miracles can be explained in a manner which is not supernatural. Again, you would have to do a great deal of research to substantiate that. Catholicity does not pertain to Phocianism. Argument one, the mark of Catholicity is defined that property of the church by which it flows out into nearly the whole world as something conspicuously numerous and everywhere one. But such is not the case with the Phocian church. Therefore, it should not be called Catholic. The Phocian church is not one. Therefore, it is not Catholic. Indeed, St. Pacanius sharply defined Catholic what is everywhere one. So unity and Catholicity are two things that go absolutely together and are sine qua non. N national churches and the Catholic Church are opposed to each other. See, so the Church of England and you know, the, the Church of Scotland, the Church of Canada, you see it all over the place, all of those. And in, in, in America, it's the Episcopal Church, but otherwise it would be the, the Anglican Church. I mean, before the, the French, the, French, the American independence it was the anglican church but then anglican was a little bit distasteful to the newly independent country so they called it the episcopal church to dis to meaning the, the church with bishops uh, opposing it to the baptists and other groups the uh, uh the, the puritans that became the congregationalists in massachusetts and those areas and uh who believe in practically nothing now and um, uh, Presbyterians, so it's the Episcopal Church. So, yeah, so. Um, <clears throat> um, so that very idea of a national church is, is uh, opposed to Catholicism. But the Phocian churches are national and ethnic. Therefore, they lack Catholicity. The minor is evident from those things which we said about the churches of Constantinople, Russia, Greece, and Bulgaria, independent one from the other, but especially uh, the Roman church. And as I said, that idea that we don't want to be a national church is what motivated the church absolutely to insist on its own state. That is, the Vatican City state, as tiny as it is, it, it is not Italy. This is not the Italian Catholic Church. So he, the, he, the popes did not want the center of the church to be on any ter territory except church territory. So that, it, because it's offensive to Catholicity. For the Russian church, which embraces by far the greatest number of Phocians, is practically bound up with the Russian Empire. Now, this is before the revolution, but uh, it was suppressed. Uh, the the uh, Russian Orthodox religion was, was suppressed, and then it was, uh, uh, how would you say, resurrected by Stalin in 1943, I think it was, uh, in order to get the Russians going against the Germans. The Nimietsky, and uh, the um, and then continued uh, in the 50s, 60s, uh, up to the, the 1990s, the Perestroika, uh, as an arm of the KGB. So it was there, but um, KGB infiltrated, and uh, then. With Putin, it has uh, become the established church in Russia again, as it's, uh, and, and he has restored churches all over Russia. Yes? N no, no, he's, he's a Russian Orthodox. But I'm saying that, I'm just giving you the, sort of the history of the, this is written at the time of the Tsar, Tsar Nicholas II. So I'm just giving you the history of what happened in Russia since this time. So, uh, uh, no, I mean, he's a hard person to figure out. Uh, he goes to the, I've, I've seen, uh, he goes to the Easter service, uh, at least that. I mean, I don't know if he goes to church every Sunday, whatever he does, but I mean, he, 
He's certainly not hostile to religion. He also, uh, I mean, there's complete religious freedom for the Catholic Church in, in Russia. You know. uh, so the, the cathedral there is functioning. And, uh, it was suppressed by Stalin. It was in terrible condition. And then it was fixed up after the perestroika. But uh, he, uh, he also built a, um, I, think it was, I think it was under Putin, yes. Uh, there was the canonization of the Tsar and his family by the Russian Orthodox Church, and then they built a, upon the site. Yeltsin had torn down the building that they were murdered in, and for some reason, I don't think it was had anything to do with the Tsar, but they, you know, to build, who knows, a candy store or something like that. And the, the uh, so, but they raised all that, and they put a big uh, uh, sabor, which is a cathedral, on, on top of the place where they were murdered in uh, Yekaterinburg. So, I mean, this, you know, this, uh, he's a hard person to figure out. I don't know. I mean, he might, uh, he's uh, whatever, but th that's, that's what's, that's Russia today. But the, the Russian Orthodox uh, ceremonies are very, very heavily attended. The, uh, I mean, th there's, there's some religion in, in Russia. So, um, the Phocian churches are not eminent for their numbers, extension, or power to propagate. So they are mostly content with staying with their people and serving their people. The, there is not this drive to, to propagate the faith throughout the world. They're, it's almost impossible for them to do so because they're all national churches. How do you convince somebody in India that he should become a Greek or he should become a, a Coptic, you know, an Egyptian, or, or that he should become a Russian? You know? The number of all the churches, including the old believers, does not add up to one half of the number of Catholics. Okay, so this, these are all figures from 1900 around there. In the extension, the Phocians have scarcely gone beyond the limits of the Russian Empire and those of the Turkish Empire. So you see some Russian Orthodox in Alaska and also in California because the Russians actually colonized California. That's, you have the Russian River, the northern part, the northern coast of California was colonized by some Russians. The result is that in no nation of Europe except Russia are, are Phocian groups found in any important numbers. The same is true of America, Australia, and Asia, except for the parts of Asia, Asia which are subject to the Tsar. So yeah, that, these figures might be a little different today. I don't know why he's exempting Greece in that. <laughs> There's quite a few Greek Orthodox in Greece. Uh, I don't understand his, what he's saying, but... Uh, and there, there are a significant number of Eastern Orthodox in this country, a significant number. And they usually collect it in various areas. They, they collect it in Tarpon Springs for the sponges. Uh, they also uh, have a heavy presence in the Pittsburgh area and also in the Cleveland area and Chicago. So I'm just giving you. So. But they're around, do you see them? Um, <clears throat> um, you will look in vain for a supernatural power of the propagation of the faith. It is not conspicuous with regard to the fertility of missions, nor with heroism in preaching the gospel. So they did not go into Africa, Asia, China, 
the, uh, the islands of the Pacific as the Catholic Church did. South America, there's some Orthodox in South America, but it's usually because they went there. See, and then the priests came because they were there, the communities. But the idea of getting off a boat and, and preaching the gospel to Indians, it, it wasn't there. It is not fruitful with conversions because of martyrdom. They don't have any, or very few, people that uh, gave up their lives for it. Nor does it abound as the Roman church does with sacrifices and results in the propagation of the faith. Finally, the Phocian churches, destitute of vitality, have changed their primordial ba boundaries very little, besides the fact that some regions were lost to the schism by the sword of Mohammed, especially the Balkan states, with the exception of Serbia. One thing that could be said for the Serbians is they held out against the Mohammedans. But Albania, um, um, uh, Macedonia, what is now in Macedonia, a lot of those places were taken over by the Turks and th they lost the faith. Or were added to the schism by means of Russian persecution, tyranny, and the basis perfidy. So uh, the Russians have always been aggressive and have uh, uh, you know, become, uh, uh, you know, they, they have put pressure on you to be Russian Orthodox, etc. Apostolicity does not pertain to Phocianism. Apostolicity is that property of the church by which through a legitimate succession of pastors never interrupted from the apostles continues in identity of doctrine, sacraments, and government. There's your, you've had that already, but that is a review of the nature of apostolicity. But this cannot be attributed to the Phocians. Therefore, this church is not apostolic. Proof of the minor. The Greek Russians, both before and after the Phocian schism, professed the Roman primacy. That is assertive and provable. Therefore, the Phocian church does not continue, at least in the identity of doctrine and government, So they have split in doctrine and they have split in government. Before Photius, the seven ecumenical councils, especially Ephesus, Chalcedon, uh, Constantinople, rec uh, three, recognized the Roman primacy. But the Eastern and Western fathers taught the same thing. Both the Eastern and Western fathers taught the same thing. This will be proven later in the tract on the Roman primacy. After Photius, the councils of Lyons II, 1274, and Florence, 1439, professed the same faith with the consent of the Phocians. So at both times, they came back. Lyons II and Florence, formally, and Lyons was where they had to sing three times, filioque. <laughs> there was no uh, ecumenical... Uh, schmoozing of dogma in those days. In the Council of Lyons, session four held on July 6, letters were read, which were written in the name of 26 metropolitans, nine archbishops, and the bishops subject to them. So this was a, a major return who belonged to the Patriarchate of Constantinople. This was not a bishop or two. John the Lector, a keeper of the bookcases of the Patriarchate of Constantinople, abjured the Greek schism in the name of the prelates. Three legates of the Patriarch of Constantinople, Isidore of Kiev, the Metropolitan of all Russia, 16 Greek Metropolitans, and all the other Eastern prelates present, with the exception of Mark of Ephesus, adhered to the Council of Florence. So it was all done, except for that stinker, Mark of Ephesus. Therefore, the Phocians, in repudiating the Roman primacy, are not apostolic by reason of bo both of faith and of government. 
Before the agitation of Photius, the Church of Constantinople was a subordinate part of the Catholic Church, which the Roman pontiff ruled by divine right. But Photianism ceased to be a subordinate part of it. Therefore, Photianism is not apostolic. The major is proved by public facts. When Nicholas I.M. showed the Roman primacy in a letter which he wrote to Michael the Emperor, no Eastern bishop was able direct to directly deny it. Ignatius, the Patriarch of Constantinople, by a letter given to the Pope in the year 867, admirably professes the, the same right. Three, the Fathers at the Eighth Ecumenical Council in 869, praising that letter of Ignatius and signing a libellus of faith establishing Canon 21, profess the same thing. The texts which do this thing openly, we have included in our tract on the primacy. Among other things, the libellus of faith or of satisfaction contains very explicit profession of the Roman primacy. Photius himself at least implicitly and indirectly recognized the, the primacy of the Roman pontiff whom he attacked at the time of his first patriarchate when the, when the heat of controversy was absorbing him. Hergen Röte, there it is, oh, it is three volumes, points these out in Photius 3, so you can learn your German and then your Frakturschrift and look up, it's right in the library. The, the Greek and Russian liturgy, <laughs> or you can, you can ask Nico, that's easier. The Greek and Russian liturgy even celebrates the primacy of Peter, which we will point out in, in the theses concerning the primacy. Okay. 